welcome back. We are in the studio again with Pages Promotions Presents Indie Reads TV. I am your host, Diana Catherine Plopa, and today we have an amazingly wonderful guy in the studio. This is Mr. Chad Lee Irway. There he is. Uh, he is in the studio today to talk about his wonderful middle grade books. I think they're more than just middle grade, so I think wonderful children and adults and readers of all ages should be reading these books because well, they are super duper fun. Um, so welcome to the studio. Thank I'm you. I'm glad you're here. We're going to have a good time. Um, first of all, Tell me, what was the inspiration for starting on this writing journey for you? Oh, it was kind of a mix of a lot of things. I wanted to kind of do like TV and movies growing up and comic books, but I can't really draw. And there was no <laughs> getting around that. Um, and then when I was in like my 30s, late 30s, I thought, well, I used to be able to write pretty well, so maybe I can do that. And I decided I would write a series of short stories in the first... The first one was like a fantasy story, and it was terrible, and so <laughs> I got like 10 pages in, and I threw it away, and I sat down, and I really thought, what are the things that I, like, what are the things that I liked as a kid, and what are the things that I liked now, mm -hmm. and maybe I can use both of them, and I really liked kid detectives, like the Hardy Boys, and Encyclopedia sure. Brown. Yeah, uh, Encyclopedia I liked Encyclopedia Brown. Brown. He was fun. He was awesome, and yeah. then, of course, I was always like a big monsters, scary movie guy, Okay. Um, and of course, Monster Squad. Uh, like a, a classic 80s yep. movie. And I thought, well, maybe I could bring them both together because I didn't know of anything that had the kid detectives and the monsters. I mean, maybe a little bit on the Scooby-Doo side of things. Yeah, but not really. But, they yeah. were more ghosts and goblin stuff. Right. Yeah. And then I wanted, a, I wanted to set it in a town where um, I could keep them forever. So I wanted to, I wanted to Simpsons them. Where I could okay. start the story, <laughs> and if I wrote it for 30 years, nobody ever got out of the sixth grade. <laughs> Everything was the same forever. You know, I know Bart's been going to the fourth grade for like the last 33 years. All right, yeah. I wanted the same thing. I could just write it forever um, because like, I, was moving, I was moving around a lot when I was a kid. My dad was Navy, so we moved okay. about every five or six years. So, of course, every half a decade I'd have to go through the losing all my friends and being oh, sad and move school. away to everything yeah, yeah. and I don't know anybody um, and it even in translates today and if uh, one of my favorite TV show ends I still kind of get that sad like oh my friends went home and yeah. <laughs> never see them again <laughs> right. and so I wanted a series if I was going to do a series I wanted a series I could do perpetually forever you know, until I just was like, well, I've explored every possible thing I can do. Well, and, and the series idea that you came up with is a good idea because even into senility, you can still write like a sixth grader. Right, yeah. right, right. <laughs> so even when you're old, I you can, can really, still write little kids. I can kids really go downhill <laughs> a ways before I, before I just can't do it anymore. So, that's yeah, right, that's right. It's a good insurance policy. <laughs> Um, See, there, there's always an option. Yeah, yeah, there's always a silver lining to everything. Right, yeah. um, and so since I couldn't really do any sort of drawing comic books was out of the question and the funds to do movies and tv was you know outside of my grasp yeah, yeah. Uh, i thought well i'll write and i got i got 20 or 30 pages into the first masterminds book which at the time was called paging dr vampire <laughs> an appointment with with fear was originally called paging dr vampire and this is appointment with no it's not that is there, there we go there it is. yep that was originally Paging Dr. Vampire, um, and I wrote like 20 or 30 pages of it, and I was like, I could actually probably make this kind of a little novella, like a kid's book. Uh -huh. And so I just kept pushing through, and then uh, kind of halfway through, I stopped, because I didn't know like how big a kid's book should be. Sure. Uh, so I started looking into like Goosebumps and... Mm -hmm. Um, Michigan, what is it? Michigan, Michigan Chillers, Chillers and yeah. American Chillers. Yeah. And uh, I know R.L. Stein, all his Goosebumps books, he aims for 20,000 words. Yes. So I was like, okay, that's a good target. And I think Appointment with Fear comes in around 32,000. Um, and I thought that's good because that's something that a kid yeah. can read maybe on a long car ride well, or over and the I, weekend. I've worked with fourth, fifth, sixth graders, and these books are perfect for them. Yeah. Really, that you hit you hit it right on the mark. This well, is you. perfect for the age group. Because I go in and teach writing workshops for these kids. 
And I, I have some second and third graders that could be reading your books, no problems. Awesome. Yeah. So you you definitely did it. So let's talk a little bit about I did it Light again. Years trilogy. I did it again. <laughs> you know, it's late technology. Um, so Masterminds Incorporated. I love this idea of you having a um, a home for all of your books to live in. Right. So what made you decide on Masterminds? Uh, I actually didn't. I just had the idea that I wanted kid detectives in a town filled with monsters, but where all the humans didn't know it was like a monster haven. Okay. So the, the whole series is set at a fictional town called Wolverton, Massachusetts, that is like a sanctuary for monsters. <laughs> and there's like a tiny little group of humans that know the monsters are there. But for the most part, humans as a whole are pretty oblivious to the creatures in Wolverton and I didn't have a good name. I couldn't think of anything. And so what I did is I texted my um, my grandson who was in the fifth grade and I just said, I've got a kid, a group of kid detectives mm -hmm. and they have to solve mysteries where monsters are running amok in town. What, what do you think is a good name? What would you call their detective agency? And within three minutes, he texted me back, Masterminds Incorporated. Perfect. Yeah, and I was like, yep, that's what it is. <laughs> and your grandson's name? Jaden. Okay, Jaden gets full credit. <laughs> yeah, he gets 100% of the credit for Masterminds Incorporated. Okay, so um, my technology is not helping me today. There we go. So Appointment with Fear. Give us the brief synopsis for an Appointment with Fear. Appointment with Fear, basically um, the main character in the book, Jesse Beamish, moves to town, so he's the new kid. It was something I could relate to because I had been through that several times, so that's kind of where I started at. So he's a new kid in town. He doesn't have any friends. It's the first day of school tomorrow. Mm -hmm. And and so that's kind of what the whole thing is focused on is just the terror of going to a new school and not have any friends. Well, and you have a lot of experience yeah, with that. Yeah, I have a lot yeah, of experience yeah. with that. So yeah. I knew exactly where to come from uh, when it came to that. And he makes a couple of friends in school and everything seems like it's kind of going pretty well until he finds out there's something not quite right. Some force is petrifying adults in Wolverton, to, so they're incapacitated, and he feels compelled to figure out what it is. How he fun. He just can't rest until he knows what it is, and then eventually he has his own encounter with the monster, which sort of solidifies the fight, and that's when they all come together as Masterminds Incorporated, which is a detective agency uh, Jesse Beamish has when uh, he and was I'm, in his hometown of Boston. So I'm guessing that Jesse makes this... I haven't read the book, unfortunately, you know, because my TBR pile is like this tall. <laughs> um, but I'm guessing it's he and a bunch of his friends get together and create this agency, or is it yep. him just on his own? Nope, him and, his, him and three friends was Jesse Beamish, and uh, Shelby Anatoly and Jonah Mortimer and Caleb Crenshaw. Great names. <laughs> all come together and form Masterminds Incorporated. Okay. And they even have business cards. That's awesome. In the book. <laughs> That's awesome. So the next book is Don't Hold Your Breath. I love this cover. Thank you. <laughs> it's a really great I monster. wish I could take credit for it. That's, that's all Brian Ritson right there. It was epic. It, it is epic. That's great. I mean, there's so much going on here, and there's... I just love the look on that guy's face. He's just so cool. Um, <laughs> so let's talk about the series for a second because um, you're going to write these books in perpetuity as far as we're concerned. That's the plan, right? yeah, you're, yeah. you're forever. So um, do you leave each book with a hook or a cliffhanger to take you into the next, or are these standalone installments? That is, that's a good question, and... I kind of battled with that for a while because I wanted them to be standalone. So if, let's say, 10 years from now you picked up book 12 mm -hmm. and you read it, it would make it would make enough sense you could read it. Sure. Um, but I had to finally accept the fact that there's too much world building in mm -hmm. Masterminds with mm -hmm. the monsters. And, of course, then you end up with secret societies and, sure. and all these things things so there's a lot of world building that ended up going into the mastermind series so I, I do feel like you could read them 
independently. I try to keep them that way with just mm -hmm. some basic descriptions of characters so you're not lost when somebody shows up. But each time you read it, you get an enhanced understanding right. of characterization and world building. and yeah, so, so you could read them individually, but there's more depth the more of them you read. Yeah, because yeah, I add a little... Each book adds something. You know, Appointment with Fear. There's not a lot of world building because you're introducing all the characters and everything. Mm -hmm. um, and then in Don't Hold Your Breath, you get more of the world. So you're going to get a broader view of Wolverton and what exactly is going on because right. that's kind of part of the conflict in that book. And then book three, the one I, that will be coming out in December. The that Rise one. Of, yeah, The Rise of Sceptre Call. That one so far is kind of my favorite to write so far because I have enough of the world established. So now you get I to can, focus more on characters. Yeah, I can really jump in and start like showing how all the pieces, like if you've read the first two books, then it starts bringing some of these pieces sure. together and really show some of the depth of the town. So let's go back to this one. Um, can you give us the synopsis of Don't Hold Your Breath? Yes, Don't Hold Your Breath. Um, the four main characters stay the same, and each book is from the perspective of a different one. So Don't okay. Hold Your Breath is from the perspective of Shelby Anatoly. Okay. Um, and she... Um, you know, they're doing, they're kind of doing their detective thing, which most of it's just boring, like finding lost books and stuff. Um, and the kids are getting, kind of getting to know that they're a detective group. But more importantly, the, um, sort of the group of secret adults that know about the monsters mm -hmm. are realizing that masterminds are kind of, they know what's going on and they're solving some of these problems. And one of the main characters goes missing. Okay. Um, and they find out that he goes missing in a uh, protected merfolk breeding ground. It's absolutely off limits to everybody due to treaties between the humans and merfolks. <laughs> and of course, that protected so doesn't that's stop kind, them. So that's kind of like a, 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 a um, safari sanctuary for Kinda, yeah. merfolk. Yep. <laughs> yeah, that's, great that's idea. exactly what it is. So. What a great idea. So oh the, it's protected, and you can't go there, but, of course, that doesn't stop masterminds from doing everything they can to solve it. And, of course, it just gets deeper into the mayhem and more of the town and some of the secret aspects of it as they go as well. Okay, so are there then – there's are there just pockets of humans in this town that know about – I mean, if, if you've got a protected sanctuary area, then I would guess the whole town would know that these monsters exist, but – is, am I getting that wrong, or are there there's, limited yeah, there's little pockets, pockets that know, um, and a lot of it is veiled in, you could say magic exists, even though I don't actually come out and say that in the book. Okay. There's something like that, but a lot of it is trickery. Okay, you know, so, so use, is it is it more of a flavor of like Loch Ness and Bigfoot, yeah. that kind of thing, where a whole bunch of people know it exists, but nobody really believes it exists? That's part of it, yeah. The big okay. thing in Wolverton is a lot of people... Like, oh, there's a werewolf sighting. Oh, sure there was. There's always a werewolf sighting over there. Got um, it. And sometimes it's just it's just fake. The merfolk breeding ground is act actually, I can't remember the name of the bird in the book, but it's uh, it's like a super rare bird in Massachusetts, and that's a protected nesting ground ah. according to the Department of Natural Resources. Of Got course, it. the people in the know know that those birds aren't anywhere near Wolverton. Yeah, they, they live in South Africa somewhere. Right, yeah, so they're, yeah. they're way okay. out of here. But it keeps the people out of the merfolk breeding ground, so it's good enough. Yeah, no, it's perfect. So um, tell us about the new book coming out, then. What's the synopsis here? Uh, Sceptre Call. The synopsis is, uh, this is from the perspective of Jonah Mortimer, who's kind of like the smarty pants of the bunch. She's mm -hmm. He is almost 100% based off Encyclopedia Brown. Okay. He reads something, he knows it forever. Okay. You know, he just sort of memorizes it. And Sceptre Call is a mummy. He's actually, he's the leader of a mummy. He's a pharaoh that, through nefarious means, mummified himself in order to escape a bargain he made with an even worse underworld entity and marched his whole army across the ocean, like under the ocean, and then ended up getting trapped under the ground in Wolverton. And um, they, it gets inadvertently unearthed, and then Scepter Call emerges and unleashes plagues on the town because he's basically oh just like a moving catastrophe. He just wipes out <laughs> everything in his path. And, of course, masterminds can't let that stand. So, can't. Yeah. So they have to jump in and, and you know, save the day. This is spectacular. Oh, oh my you. gosh. 
what fun! I wish I was 12. What it's fun! Right. It <laughs> um, it's, it's, helps me kind of relive it, too, when I'm writing it. Sure. Yeah, I, I would imagine it would. And for your grandchildren. Oh, yeah. To share these wonderful, wacky stories with them. So, let's get to that. Did these come about as stories that you... I know, you know, a couple of my stories came out as I was telling them to children and ta-da, their stories. Right. Did it work that way for you or did you pre-plan these? Are you a plotter or a planter? Or I, a... I plan them all. Yeah, well, do you? I do now. A mo- appointment with, with fear was just like a seat of your pants. Mm-hmm. Like I just started writing it. I had a basic idea of what I wanted to do and I just went for it. And okay. then I went back and kind of changed things so they made sense. Um, and then after that... Um, I actually took an RL, the master class from R.L. Stein. Oh, nice. And I wanted to do that. he told me he outlines, like every Goosebumps book, he outlines them. Okay. And so that's what I did with Don't Hold Your Breath. I was like, well, I'll try it. I mean, that makes sense. So I could go in and kind of put plot hooks and move mm-hmm. things around. And that worked out really well. And so I did the same thing with Scepter Call. And then um, I've, I'm working on the same thing for the fourth book in the series. Uh, Can you divulge called, the title? Uh, that is called Can You Say Abracatastrophe? <laughs> That's awesome. So, and I, I have the art for that, too, but that one's... that I Did I release that? I may have released that, but... No, hey, well, but you didn't release it to me. No, so. that book, so it's far off on the horizon yet. But. You'll, have to, you'll have to send it to me so I can put it up. Um, so you told me that these books, at least so far are written from the point of view of the main characters. So there's four in the masterminds, yep. right? So there's one book in each. What happens when you run out of masterminds? Uh, have you thought about writing one from a monster point of view? I have, um, but I've been kicking the idea around. Right now, currently, the the tentative plan is just to rotate through masterminds. Okay. So it will, it will always go Jonah, Shelby, I'm sorry, Jesse, Shelby, Jonah, Caleb. Okay. And then Jesse Shelby, Jonah, Caleb. It'll just rotate through. But okay. I have been kicking around the idea of doing it from the monster's point of view. I just can't wrap my head around how exactly I want to do it. Okay. And what about from an adult perspective? Have you thought about that? That one I have not. One of those, oh, you meddling kids things. No, but that is a really good idea. I hadn't thought of that. The monster idea I thought of right away, like after I oh, finished you, the first book. You made but. the connection to Scooby-Doo. That, oh, you meddling kids was the first thing that came into my head. And so I wondered if you were going to approach it from that perspective. No, but it's an excellent idea. I will 100% steal that. Okay, it's yours. <laughs> go go right ahead. It's yours. I give you right here well, on television. It. Give you free license. All right, unmitigated right. use yeah, just, of the meddling I want a copy when you write it. Fair enough. <laughs> That's a fair deal. <laughs> <All right. laughs> um, this is a really great concept that you come up with. Thank you. I, I think it's fabulous to engage kids to read, to I- engage their imaginations. Um, do you see any downfalls? to writing for kids do you see do, are there th- mm. are there certain things that you maybe have to pay more attention to i mean aside from the obvious you know language right but do do you see any any negative sides or any um uh you know details that you have to pay attention to when you write for kids that normally you may not have to for adults uh absolutely i think um in two different ways one is specific to masterminds and one is specific to kids of course keeping the subject matter, like you want them to, I want to give them shutters. I don't want to terrify them. Mm-hmm. You know, I don't. I don't ever want a letter from an, a parent saying that my kid read your books and couldn't sleep for three days. I Thank don't you want very that. much. Yeah. yeah. I want them to say they read them with the lights on, you know, under the covers. Right. But then they slept soundly, and that's that's what I want. I want them to be like creeped out. I don't want them horrified. Right. And screaming, right. but also. Um, so that's a little bit of a challenge is making sure I don't get uh, too far out there with the horror. Mm-hmm. Um, and obviously I try to make sure – I always make sure there's no, like, gore. You right. Know, nobody gets torn apart or nobody anything like filleted. that. Nobody gets filleted. Yeah. And there's no weapons. Okay. I never – nobody ever has weapons. That's just kind of my thing. I don't want any – nobody has guns or They're intelligent knives. solutions. Yeah. 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 Um, and I try to keep all the all the solutions are not they're nonviolent conflict resolution. Great. The point is not for masterminds to defeat Dracula or kill the werewolf. The point mm-hmm. is for them to outsmart them or find a way um, to 
you know, solve the problem without destroying. Nessun, the no monster gets destroyed mm -hmm. in the book. That's not the point of the books is to kill Dracula. Behavior modification. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, and some, some monsters are bent on destruction. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think I try to do a pretty good job of, of uh, curtailing that without, um, what would it be? Without killing them or... Um, making like everyone can't be or sick like, or delusioned. Well, and 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 you can't always have a reformed monster either, because right. where would the fun be in that? Yeah, yeah, right. they don't all yeah. end up being friends at the end. Right. Uh, yeah. Yeah, that's a good way to put it. Yeah, I do want them to solve the problem, and sometimes the monster has to pay consequences. Wolverton, mm -hmm. I don't get into it too much in the books, but Wolverton does have like a monster prison okay. where they will st monsters that cannot be monster timeout. Yeah. It, that's, that's exactly what it is. It's monster timeout. Monster out. detention. You can't play well with the other monsters and humans. So you have to go over here for a while. And that's so great. that's what they do. Um, so that's kind of the, that's my limitations there is to make sure I right. don't get carried away. Mm -hmm. And then also because I want masterminds to be a perpetual unaging series, I also have to be very careful about referencing time. Yeah, I can't make culture reference or right. ref the reference of like you can say a couple days passed or a week passed. That doesn't matter. But I try. I stay away from holidays. I don't want them right. to have like right. seventeen Christmases. Sure. Um, but sure. they never leave the sixth grade. It's like it's like I thirty. <laughs> Jeez. Right. Uh. What? So so that leads me to a really interesting question. Um, and and this is one of the areas that I struggle with when I wrote my children's fairy tale was. Keeping the language and the dialogue kid, not friendly, but kid relevant. Right. I like to use adult vocabulary because right. I, I like big words. I just do. And I like complex sentences. It took me a year to write a fairy tale because I couldn't take sesquipedalian and just simply say he likes to use big words right. you know right. <laughs> this is a challenge i had so I, I was constantly rewriting it are you finding the same challenge and how do you deal with that um it's a little bit of a challenge because i i'm also a big fan of words and i love to learn new words and mm -hmm. and try to weave them into the story so it is really hard and i've rewritten some i've had some revisions where i've gone back and I'm like that's that's not that works great for me, mm -hmm. but the eleven-year-old is not right. going to know what this is. So sometimes I will leave sort of the heavier words in there and structure the sentence so that when the kid gets to it, they maybe don't know what the word is, but the but they can sentence get it or the context. paragraph, yeah, is yeah. written in such a way that they'll be like, okay, I know what he's saying, and then maybe they learn a new word, maybe they don't care, but they don't lose anything from the story because of it. Right. Right. Um, if you, you know, static question comes up every single time, but let's do it from a different um, generation. If, if a child were to come to you and say, Mr. Irway, I'd like to learn how to write books the way you do. Right. How would you mentor that child off that path? I mean, onto that path, off in that direction. Uh, I actually have had that question. I've, done, I've been lucky enough to get a couple of school visits where I got to go to an intermediate school and a mm -hmm. middle school and actually talk to the kids. And that question does come up from a handful of the students that are interested in writing. And um, the biggest piece of advice I give them is to, personally, I would plan out what you want to write. What do you, Even if it's just a generic bullet point, like I want mm -hmm. these things to happen to my character or in my story or whatever. But more importantly than any of that is just to write some part of it every day. That's yeah. the thing I struggle with the most. I know after a month goes by, especially a slow month where I don't get a lot of writing done, and I think, you know, if I'd have written, I, I'd have a book and a half done yeah, right yeah. now, and I got nothing. I think that's a challenge for every author, no matter their age. Yeah. You know, I'm constantly running into people saying, if I could only apply myself for an hour a day, it's amazing what I could get right. done. Yeah. yeah, I do exactly the same thing, and that's so that's what I try to get the kids, if they can develop the habit of writing on, you know, a paragraph, something just every day get in the habit of writing something that at mm -hmm. the end of the school year they could have you know they'd have an epic tale absolutely Do 365 days of writing sure sure you get a lot done yeah so that's that's the big advice i would give them because really at the end of the day you just got to keep doing it over and over again i i know i would love that every one of my books is exactly the same level of awesome mm -hmm. but i have accepted the fact that book 15 will be better than book one Oh, because sure. I will Just have learned. Through natural the, attrition. Yeah. yeah. 
You know, and that's, that's just something we have to accept. I wish I could go back and tell my 12-year-old self, just keep writing. Even if it's garbage, even if you just print it out, put it in a folder and a file mm-hmm. and forget about it forever, just keep writing because then when you're 20 or 30 or 50 or 70 years old and you decide to write the book, it'll be 100,000 times better. Absolutely. So, um, technology. I love technology. There we go. Okay. <laughs> so, um, you're self-publishing or independent publishing. Yep. So you, are you self-publishing or with a small press? Um, I... I created Parallel Vortex, so I guess you could call it the it's smallest in- of presses. Right. A micro press. Right. It's but just it's, me. But it's independent publishing. Right. I mean, I, I've done the same thing with my books as well. Um, we have about two and a half minutes left. This show is aimed at serving independent authors. So what would be the biggest strengths, weaknesses, pitfalls, or, or joys that you might want to share about the independent publishing process? I would have to say... I think it's game for anybody to do it just because it gives people an opportunity to get their words out there, whether they're good, bad, or indifferent. Mm-hmm. Sometimes, you know, you hear people talk about, I've got, I have a book in me. Right. You know, i got to get it out. Uh, maybe it's one and maybe it's a hundred. I'd like to think I have a hundred books in me, but maybe that won't be the case five years from now. Um, so I would, I would definitely encourage anybody to do it, even if they were just chipping away at it. You know, you hear a lot of stories of people that take 10, 20 years to write a book. Sure. Just keep chipping away at it and work on it. But I would I would caution them that it's not going to be a, okay, my book's printed, it's on Amazon, or it's on Ingram, or it's on wherever it's going to be, and now I'll just wait for the checks to show up. Yeah, I've had this conversation with other authors. We call it the field of dreams fallacy. Yes. Which is, if I write it, people will buy it. And that's not necessarily no. how it works. No. I, I, I personally do not have a lot of luck with Amazon or Ingram. My, granted, I don't have a lot of time to market it as well as I would have liked mm-hmm. to. But that's okay because what I get, I get a great return out of going to schools. Yeah. Um, I sold 90 books in three hours. That's spectacular. Oh, my gosh. I mean, literally did a talk. (laughs) I'm going to write kids books. (laughs) I know. It kind of blew me away because you give like this 45-minute talk to the kids and half of them are squirming and the Mm -hmm. other half of them are, you know, just kind of staring blankly at you. But you get the questions. And once they can ask questions and engage, that seems to be really fires them up and then you know i sit down thinking three or four of them might pick up a book and then i've got a line of kids that go to the other side of the cafeteria and i'm like this is awesome wow yeah and they're all super excited and and i love getting emails back from teachers later when they're like oh yeah so and so read your book and he loved it and we did a book report about it and it was great and like that to me that's worth selling any number of books i agree wholeheartedly Thank you so much for coming Thank out. You. I'm so glad to have you with us, and, and I hope when the next book comes out, when, when you re- release the zombie book. Yep. What's the name? It's the Rise of Sceptra Call. Yes. Please, here, let me throw it back up one more time. That one's coming out. When is it coming out? December 1st is what we're aiming for. Awesome. When it comes out, will you come back and talk to us about yes, it? That'd for be sure. great. Awesome. Thank you so much for coming out, Thank Chad. Thank you. Have a safe drive home. I will do my best. Thanks. <laughs>